Welcome back. Uh, it's the third session, uh, Contexts of Concern, or even Contexts of Concern and Opportunity. Um, just to remind you, same format as this morning, uh, three short papers, and then if you can hold over questions for the panel discussion uh, after the papers. Uh, and there, uh, all the papers uh, between 10 and 15 minutes. And uh, with that, uh, great pleasure to introduce, uh, on behalf of a number of colleagues, uh, Dr. Chantal Canella uh, from the University of Manchester. So um, we've been asked to talk about methodological uh, lessons from lithic scatters. And I think I'd particularly like uh, to really talk about the positives uh, in terms of work that's happened in the last decade or so. And really the sort of groundbreaking work and innovative practice um, that we can all take inspiration from and with some that can be rolled out more, more broadly. Um, and that's one of the things to think about, sort of ta uh, taking um, good practice and how we, ha how we share this and how we, uh, how we formalise this. Um, I'm going to be speaking particularly about um, those upper Paleolithic uh, blady things, I'm afraid. Um, and I think, which has played a bit of a cameo role so far, but does have very sort of distinctive uh, contexts and requirements. Um, and these are actually quite heterogeneous, um, so long blade material, a context very similar to sort of um, Mesolithic ones. Uh, and rather different from uh, issues relating to sort of pre young Dryas and pre-LGM M scatters. Um, so I've canvassed opinion and case studies um, from my uh, co-authors, so I hope I don't make too many errors, but fortunately many of them are here to correct me if I get anything wrong. Um, I think really what I'd like to say, um, start off, is it's a very close close point, what, how much progress we have made in the last decade or so in um, issues surrounding the apothetic lithic scatters, and particularly, I think, for, for long blade material. Um, and there's been really great work in, in, in um, new methods in terms of preparation uh, and prediction of where we might uh, uh, find scatters. Um, so I'd like to really talk about some of these, um, particularly through case studies, and also how we um, understand our record as, in a way of sort of maximising uh, its potential. Um, so I think uh, really advances have come in uh, uh, prediction of uh, archaeological sites. So innovative methods with geophysics and, com and using a combination of uh, coring, uh, test pits, um, deposit and uh, for deposit modelling and a uh, sort of realization that uh, trial trenching is um, has maybe is, is not really the way forward to understand uh, uh, past pa uh, past uh, sediments and locate lithic scatters it needs to be a, in a combination with EC um, and I think one thing that's also been clear in work over the over the last um, ten years or, or couple of decade couple of decades. Is there's actually very been very little, uh, relatively little work on the Upper Paleolithic um, from academic context. So it's really um, commercial archaeology which really driven these innov innovative methods um, to produce really good practice um, and really drive a prospection and research agenda forward. Um, I'd like to really g give some really nice examples of how um, uh, uh, these work. Um, so first of all, um, talk about Oxford. Um, uh, work at uh, uh, Becks Hill. Um, here uh, we have a combination of, of geophysics um, to uh, locate uh, island-like fe features with the floodplain, um, uh, combined with uh, boreholes, so for a large number of boreholes, um, large number of evalua uh, evaluation trenches, test pits and auguring, a way of sort of developing a, a deposit model and refining this. Um, and what's, I think, really uh, innovative is um, might sort of uh, push to get um, to, once these sediments are understood uh, in more detail, to really um, uh, push for understripping of these areas. So um, f uh, four and a half of uh, six major um, lithic scatter sites were sort of understripped by about um, uh, 20 centimetres. 
and this left these um, uh, lithic scatters ready for further work with, uh, with a grid system and, uh, and test pitting and, uh, 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 and really excavant excavations. And I think this is, um, I think we can really see the importance of this work, the scale of the material that's been recovered by use bringing together uh, these different methods and having this really sound understanding of, of, of the deposits and the likely locations of lithic scatters. So a huge number of um, upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic lit lithic scatters and, and the post -excavation, with the post-excavation analysis of this, it's really going to push forward both the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic um, uh, research agenda and understanding of both these periods. Um, I think deposit model has been really important, um, and particularly um, some of the things that have been talked about um, with aggregate levy um, uh, modelling, um, big, uh, uh, big developer-funded developer projects, and particularly in the sort of southeast, there's a really good um, uh, some of the models round uh, the Thames, um, the Thames tributaries. These have been really uh, obviously these uh, give us a more of an understanding where we might find upper Paleolithic sites, at least in certain periods. Um, but I think it's really been important for increase, increasing curatorial awareness of where we might find things. And that sort of formalisation and understanding of where we might find, particularly long blade material, has been really important and is a real, real, real advance. Um, as we're sort of thinking of... Um, uh, working towards the future. Um, I think one of the things we need to be thinking about is um, how these may be picking out particular types of archaeology. So the concentration in, in floodplains on archaeology of uh, in targeting uh, little sand and gravel areas is maybe picking up certain types of, uh, of settlement, for example. We don't know really enough about um, late upper Paleolithic uh, settlement systems to understand it yet whether we're picking up a very particular element of, of, of activity or settlement. And sort of the focus on this may also um, lead to lack of con uh, less consideration of other contexts that might be equally important. Um, so, in areas we do know uh, quite well, um, here referring to um, particularly early Mesolithic uh, work in the Vale of Pickering, but also there's long blade material here as well. Um, we do see these little uh, higher ground sand and, sand, sand and gravel areas uh, being used actually for, set for, for settlement, but we see really important, the, the landscape's used in very particular ways, so you get very particular types of archaeology in particular areas. Um, so most of uh, Graham Clark's site, um, the classic Sarkar stuff, was actually material that's deposited underwater, something that might not be picked up as an area uh, for investigation. And similarly, we have very important um, activities happening on Fen Car and, and, and PT areas, again, which might not be expected if we're just targeting, targeting certain types of photography. Uh, Tim Shadow Hall's work in the Vale of Pickering digging test pits um, uh, for over 30 years. He picked up off-site activity, so use of tools in the landscape. Um, but we also get quite dense areas of activity, so a little axe-making factory, um, and also very specific uh, instances. And I think that's maybe one of the sort of challenges for the future, sort of learn, understanding a bit more how, uh, what different types of activity happen in the landscape and how you want to target particular areas. It may be that se uh, settlement is, is more important to target and it's very difficult to target some of these more off-site areas, but they, sh they shouldn't be entirely forgotten. Um, and we can also see some of this happening uh, with uh, the long blade of polythene material in, in, in the Vale of Pickering. So we have bigger, bigger sites, we've got smaller activity areas. And on Flixen Island, in the middle of the lake, we've got a horse, a horse butchery site, but that only has a, a couple of associated pig bits of flint. So we, we are likely to see these um, uh, types of activity, uh, different differential types of activity happening um, that we need to sort of think about how we can how we can pick up. Uh, 
Um, we also need to sort of uh, think more about perhaps unexpected deposits and deposits we're sort of learning, beginning to learn uh, more about. Um, so uh, Linton Cooper and the, the, the um, uh, ULAS uh, work at, at Glaston in Rutland, this was at the, la the last week of excavation of a, of a medieval village uh, when, they, when they came across um, uh, uh, LRJ, lithic material, and faunal remains, um, which, which had been fortuitously preserved. Um, and this has happened in this sort of upland ridge uh, through sort of the collapse of plateau sediments into, into faults, and, faults and fissures. Um, now, this is, is stuff that wasn't expected, uh, that we'd have such a fortuitous survival, we'd have these, these sort of capture points in the landscape. But I think as I, we're beginning to see that these are areas we should actually be beginning to, to look for. Um, so... Uh, so very similar things going on at, at Beedings, um, <coughs> where Colcott hy hypothesised very similar uh, geomorphological context leading to the capture of the historically known uh, Beedings collection, which was then uh, tested by geophysics, which um, located these little fissures, which were capture points in this uh, sort of upland plateau for the uh, LRJ uh, uh, material. So there are certainly uh, new, uh, and Colcott's hypotheses, they, 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 we should be looking, these may be more widespread, these, uh, these sort of little, uh, areas, to look for um, some of the earlier um, pre-LGM archaeology that's uh, rather more diff difficult um, to find and which is more rarely preserved. And it's also very interesting in terms of the LRJ in that uh, sort of historical records of the LRJ are very uh, fluvial associate have very strong fluvial associations. So having these upland uh, sites again complements and helps us understand the way the way activities are happening in in these past landscapes. <coughs> um, the other thing we really need to do is. Um, is maximising the potential of, of this record, which is often very partial. Um, and part of that is sort of understanding uh, this record uh, through very detailed study. Uh, so Lawrence Billington has, has reviewed, um, for example, uh, East Anglia, and he's drawn attention to the fact that most late Arthalithic contexts are, are ploughs and satyrs. So really thinking about how we can move away and understand this sort of more problematic uh, and difficult record rather than uh, hunting for sort of pristine sites is really important. And Lawrence's work has, he's, 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 um, he's sort of articulated how plows and scatters, depending on uh, the cultivation history and depending on the collection uh, history, so they can, they some of them can be very, very valuable, though they do also have their, their problems. So here's an example of his from Oily Hall. Uh, the field walked uh, scatter seemed to be early Mesolithic, but once you put test bits in, all these very tiny microliths came up, and it seems it's much more of a, a late Mesolithic site. Um, similarly, another plough zone scatter, um, at Laverine in Jersey, which was discovered on this, this, this field here. Again, this sort of combination of, of prospection methods, uh, so geophysics, coring, and digging lots and lots of test pits, has allowed us to understand where this material is coming from and actually chase back uh, this plow zone material through an understanding of the slope processes that were going on to an area of more in, intact uh, sediments uh, further up where we found beginning to find the most exciting types of archaeology, a huge uh, Magdalenian site, including um, uh, incised uh, 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 plaquettes. Um, and similarly, we shouldn't really discount the potential of sites in very unpromising areas. A little uh, light at a site at Le Rookery Farm uh, in Cambridge, a Fadermessa site, which has been fortuitously preserved in a, dip, in a little dip in the topography and we worked into a Holocene buried soil. Um, as you can see from the plot, this, there's problems with this site, there's lots of size sorting, things being washed in. But actually, post excavation methods such as refitting really showed that actually most of the material was actually there. We could really uh, use that to understand the activities that had gone on at the site, even though it wasn't in, in primary uh, context. 
And conversely, um, refitting um, at the site of La Sagesse um, has also shown that what seemed to be a, a perfectly beautiful in situ site actually had one part of it had been quite heavily truncated. So we can use our, our post excavation methodologies really to get the most out of this, this method. So really just to uh, sum up, um, I think the, there have been amazing work that's been going on in the last couple of decades that's really increased awareness of likely context of Upper Paleolithic archaeology, particularly the, le the sort of later parts with, the, uh, uh, with long blade material, particularly in, in sort of the southeast. Um, and there's more of an understanding of, uh, of um, and a uh, realisation we need to draw upon um, these innovations in prospection and excavation and uh, that we need to do, that, that uh, upper Paleolithic sites are expensive in terms of the post-excavation that needs to be, needs to be done. Um, but there are still challenges in rolling out um, some of these innovations uh, more, more widely and translating this, this sort of local ex uh, expertise and good practice into, into, into standards. So there have been um, uh, some really, really good examples. So the Sussex archaeological standards are relating to lithic scatters really formalises um, a, a lot of the issues I've brought up. Um, and really, and, uh, echoing points have been made before, understanding our record, its partialness, its problems and its potentials, and how we can think about what people are doing uh, in different landscape uh, contexts. So thanks. Thanks, Chantal. And moving on, uh, the next speaker uh, is Andy Shaw. And he's also speaking, I should say, on behalf of Annalisa Rivan, who is due to be with us today, but has been uh, sadly scuppered in her uh, travel plans uh, by various problems. Uh, so, Andy, I think what was going to be a double hander is now a single hander. It is, yes, yes, you're stuck with me. Right, there we go. Yeah, well, as Rob says, this was supposed to be a full joint Anglo-French effort or Anglo-Breton effort, but unfortunately because of uh, train strikes and problems of, of, of such, analysts couldn't be here today. So I, hopefully I'll try and do it all justice myself. Um, so the title of what I'm supposed to be talking about is The Coastal and Intertidal Paleolithic Record of Northwest Europe. I'm not going to be doing the whole of Northwestern Europe in 10 minutes. So what this is really talking about is our experiences working in Jersey and Annalise's experiences working in Brittany and looking at some of the problems and potential of these environments in terms of the Paleolithic, the earlier Paleolithic record. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is this the site of Le Cotte saint -Brelard. Um I'm not going to talk about the site in any detail, really. Um, except to say it's a very important, internationally important Pleistocene site. It contains Pleistocene dis deposits which span um, the late middle and upper Pleistocene. And then within that, you've got at least 11 phases of human occupation within the site, expanding both the late middle Pleistocene and the upper Pleistocene. And you've got human fossils and faunal preservation. Um, it's also a site which has an extensive excavation history dating back to the early part of the 20th century. And that in itself has been a blessing and a curse for the site, both in terms of the state of the site we have now and our understanding of the site, because naturally it's patchy, uh, depending on which excavations you're dealing with. Now, it's the, the key thing is this is a coastal location, which is, how, which is very much under threat. So this is, this is a winter storm at the site, where you can see the, the, the storm... Um, Discharge is getting right into the west ravine of the site, attacking the base of these sediments here, these, these um, upper Pleistocene sediments. So it's got a major problem in terms of coastal erosion. The processes that you have going on at the site, you have water flow going through these upstanding sequences, material collapses, the sea comes in and it scours it out. So it's a very difficult site to deal with. It's also, it, one of the things that's protected the site and manage the site is that process of excavation. So for basically 
the better part of uh, 80 years, from 1910 to the 1980s, the site was basically constantly being excavated with a gap during the, of, of the Second World War. And what that meant was material, two things, that the site was being managed in a sense through excavation, through controlled recording of various levels of, of, of terms of legacy data, what we've got now, but through <laughs> controlled excavations until that point in the early 1980s. Another part of this was the backfill from these excavations was being thrown out of the ravine. This was protecting these upstanding sections. So you get to the point where in the early 80s, this all ceases. Protection measures have, were put in place at that point. So you've got this big deep sound in the North Ravine, which was covered over. And you have this concrete wall built up in the, in, against these important um, early middle Pleistocene deposits in the North Ravine. This is where the famous bone heaps come from. So this created a perception within the site that it was being controlled, so we being protected. The problem with that was these things are only ever temporary in terms of protection in these contexts. So what, may, what, what the net result of this was, for 30 years, it stayed like that. And the, what the net result we have now is these protection me measures have failed. You have material colla sections collapsing. Even the concrete wall itself has changed. It is not protecting the site to, to the degree it was probably originally envisaged. Material has been shown to be coming out <coughs> through those holes in that wall. So material is moving behind the wall. So in terms of the site itself, through... Um, 30 years of it be, uh, have not been excavated, you're left with quite a significant problem with collapsing sections like this. What, the what I want to talk about here is the lessons that you can sort of learn from this with Lacotte. The point we're at now with Lacotte is things are, things are being done. Extensive engineering works are planned, remedial works and, and, and removal of sediments under controlled archaeological conditions are planned. So obviously, that's going to be expensive. What you, the lesson is from Lacotte is you can't really protect locations like this. You can't protect them forever. What it's more of a case is, is managing the retreat of, the, uh, of these deposits under archaeological conditions. So a combination of engineered protection me measures and regular maintenance and removal of, uh, and um, response to coastal erosion. And this brings us to the site that Annalise works on as Menestra Gan in Brittany. This is in many ways um, a very much a parallel site to Lacotte. It's got a, a, a sequence of occupations that are, that are earlier than Lacotte. The earliest occupations are stage 13. You've got repeated occupation of the site. With heart, it's famous for having hearths, so the earliest, some of the earliest hearths in Europe. Um, and it, like Lacotte, it's a coastal cave system. The difference with, with Menes and Lacotte is that it's, 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 it is under a constant process now of excavation and management. Um, because once these deposits are exposed, this, like Lacotte, is, on the f is, is <coughs> next to the sea, it will be eroded away. So, you have, so once you're exposing deposits like this, you can't really protect them long term. It's, what you have is a, co is a combination of short term protection and excavation. Um, this is the wider area where, where Menes Dragan is, Gwendres. Um, and th these deposits along the foreshore. So there's a series, there's a series of Pleistocene deposits at, in the Menes Dragan area um, that, that relate to the, the Menes sequence. The key thing about these is um, these are protected against what's, on what it's termed, I'm sure there's an English translation, of the literal law. So basically it's, you, it's illegal to build on a, next to these cliffs or um, next to the beaches. So the main, thing, the main thing threatening the deposits in this, in this area are coastal erosion. Um, in terms of how the, it's been, the work's been managed at, at Menes Dragan, it's very, it's, very, it's very much excavation and protection. So you've got these protection, these protection measures in place which have constant maintenance from the local people. It's a, very much the local involvement of the, of, of, uh, the, of the town of Kluinek. And uh, so these, so you, so it's a combination of protection with the, with the uh, local populace who are very much, very much invested in the place and proud of this, the, 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 this, this record. So these, these, coastal, these coastal cave sites, like this, these big sequences in coastal, um, coastal deposits and cliff sections, I think the lesson with those is you can't really ever protect them as such, you have to manage them. This is a different, looking now towards the foreshore, um, 
Uh, I'm going to talk about two areas. First of all, the uh, St. Brio Bay in, North, in northern Brittany, where you've got these concentrations of, of uh, early middle Paleolithic sites. And these are, are, are very important because, uh, unlike large uh, parts of Brittany, because of the geology, you get faunal preservations in these contexts through the, through the preservation uh, uh, on calcareous dune systems in association with Lurs. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about two of these sites. The first one is Piergu. Um, this is a this is this is stage seven site, um, and it's been, and it was and it's been subject to to excavations in the 1980s. The second one um, is the site of Le Valais, which is which is nearby, which was found in the 1920s, but was subject to rescue excavation in uh, 2010. Now, the thing that uh, this particular what Annalise wanted to talk about in terms of this is that both si both sites are recorded. Uh, in the regional services of archaeology and in theory this should protect them um, because there should be no building work without authorization except this has not proved the case in terms of both of these sites uh, at Les Valais uh, building work was carried out on the foreshore without authorization and the reason in this case was there were, there, there were mechanisms in place to deal with work on the foreshore but there was a confu this confusion over his responsibility and this is something that I think crops up a lot in terms of how deposits in these foreshore contexts are managed, because it, it, it's technically not under the remit of the uh, regional archaeological surface, but the uh, Office of Maritime uh, Archaeology. Archeolo Archeolo and because of this confusion in terms of whose responsibility it was, um, construction work and its coastal defences went up, occurred on the, on the, on the seafront on where this no known site was. Second example is Piergu. Now, this the, the, this site is very again a very important site. It was originally excavated through rescue excavations in the 1980s and 1987, and uh, this was, was done in advance of the construction of this road. Now, further construction work has occurred at the site since then, including the, con the building of this concrete revetting wall and a building of a maritime centre and of a spa complex. Now, nothing happened when these were constructed. And the, and the interesting thing within this, you've got systems which are in place to deal with this, and we sort of, in a way, we sort of talk about the, like the French system a lot of the time as much better. But it's like any system like our system itself that's patchy and variable in places. And the, I think the reason why this received the attention it did in the 1980s is because you had people actively interested in the deposits, then there was a then there was, when then this next phase of work came across. The first construction was supposed to be built on stilts, and therefore it's supposed to have no archaeological impact. Apart from it went straight into the cliff sections, but there was no real um, <coughs> agitation or management for it. So it just shows in these contexts, uh, even when you've got systems within place, they don't always function. And this brings me back to Jersey, to the work we've been doing recently. Um, this is this is a foreshore site on Jersey. Now, when we started working and looking at the Pleistocene sequences on Jersey, we started off with Le Cotte de saint -Bellard. but we're also interested in these other fine spots which are around the coast. And our assumptions which we were making at this time, following previous assumptions by other people, was that all this material was coming out of cliff sections. What we've discovered is that's not the case, uh, where material including in situ early middle Pleistocene material has been found on the foreshore, in gullies within the bedrock filled with Pleistocene sediments, later sediments having been removed and truncated from these deposits uh, in this area. And this is the southwest corner of Jersey, and these, these similar deposits occur all around this area, off, both onto the foreshore and into the intertidal zone. Because of the, because of the big tidal range in Jersey, you've got access to this inter intertidal zone quite frequently. For example, down at the bottom, you've got mammoth, a mammoth tooth, which has come out of similar context at Seymour Tower, which is, as you can see, is offshore. But when at low sea level, that that you can actually walk out to this these these locations. And um, so it created a realization that in this corner of Jersey, there's these series of uh, gully systems which have had later material removed from the top of it, which are preserving sediments, preserving archaeology, and in case and in certain cases, preserving fauna. So that's, that's, so we now have a model and understanding of it. And because of the work we've been doing, it's created interest locally. Thanks. 
And from that point, people have now started to find material everywhere along this coastline. And this, in a way, is, has brought us to a point where it creates what happens next. Because how do you manage this landscape and, how, and what systems are in place to manage this landscape? It's unclear who's actually responsible for that, what happens when deposits are exposed through coastal erosion, who monitors these landscapes? It should this be a citizen-led um, system? Because there are, with the, the, there are people that we work with in a similar way what Nick was talking about earlier, to monitor these, th who are active locally in the local society, who are interested in this and who would, who would do this. But one of the things that we th I think is important, it needs to be a bit more than just mapping these deposits, mapping these fine spots. We need to understand the context that they're coming from. So it needs to be related in a way with like Nick's work at Haysborough between people identifying material and fine spots and also specialists engaging and understanding with what, the, what, the, what context this material is coming from. Um, so just as a brief overview, in terms of these, these, marine, these coastal sections and uh, these foreshore deposits that we've been encountering, these provide immense problems and immense potential. A me a marine erosion is a big challenge. Um, it exposes these Pleistocene archaeological sites, but of course it destroys them too. Um, in terms of these cliff sections and big sites and uh, extensive archaeological and geological sequences in these cliff sections, it is very difficult to ever protect them as such. It's more of a question of management and retreat under archaeological control. Um, a key part, a key one, the key first stage to any of this in any particular block of landscape uh, is under, understanding, as we've, uh, many people have said, it's understanding and modelling these coastal deposits and the erosional processes affecting them. But once you get to that point, it's a question of how these are managed. How do you how do you take this to, to a point where you actually manage, understand, and get maximum value from these uh, these these uh, um, unknown uh, the unknown landscape? One approach which I think is important is citizen capture. That's part of the story, but it can't be itself alone. There needs to be a joined approach between citizen uh, capture and recording of where material is coming from and, and specialist understanding the context of this material. Um, also, I think what it all comes down to at the end with all of this stuff is the creation and maintenance of joined up systems to mitigate against the destruction and exploit, the, and exploit its potential. And Jersey's an interesting case study for this in terms of this, because you're pretty much starting from scratch in many respects. So we've got a, and you've got a manageable block of land where we now understand what's going on with these deposits, but it has no systems in terms of dealing with, in terms of dealing with what happens in terms of its management. But these systems could be put in place. Um, and I think one of the things that we see as cross-regional issues is legislation. I mean, who is actually responsible for, the, for these intertidal in, for management of the intertidal zone and there's a clear need to integrate strategies and responses thank you thanks very much Andy and just completing the journey from onshore to offshore uh, the final speaker of this session is Dr Rachel Bino currently of Southampton but shortly to be at the Natural History Museum Hello. Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. We're good here. Yeah. All right. I do tend to move about, so if I stop being audible, just shout. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about the challenges and some of the future directions in the offshore zone. Um, I work mostly academically, so I've been speaking to various people across the commercial sector. Uh, so thank you very much to those people for their input. Some of their names are on the screen, and a couple of them are in the audience. So we have Louise Tizard from Wessex Archaeology and Kristen Himagi from Maritime Archaeology Trust. Uh, so any difficult questions, I'm going to be pointing to them at the end. Um, right, so I better begin. Okay, so what do we currently know about the offshore record? Okay, so the short answer to this question is actually um, we know very little. Increasing years have seen lots of data coming in from industry working in the offshore zone, but this is largely dominated by geophysical data sets. Um, so predominantly talking about things like seismics or sub-bottom, uh, things like multi-beam. Um, but, and obviously we have these on a very broad scale, I should say. 
um, with other smaller areas where we get kind of patches of higher resolution where we have things like cable routes and wind farm developments. Um, but the problem with this picture is that there's very little actual direct sampling going on, um, which leads to a situation where we, our ground truthing or our verification of the interpretations of the geophysics um, is not really very good. Um, and if you look at this image here, so this is an image of the excavation index from England from the years 2000 to 2013, you can see that there's a massive amount of work ongoing in the, the onshore zone, sounds lovely, um, terrestrially. Um, and this is a massive discrepancy with that which we see offshore. But it has taken us a, you know, the, a good part of 100 years to get to the situation where this amount of archaeology is happening in the terrestrial zone. So it's not really surprising that our knowledge about the offshore zone is so different. But hopefully what we can use uh, is discussions like today and work coming out of it in order to try to push the research agenda so that we can bring our knowledge of the offshore zone to a commensurate level. Because at the moment, really, what we are dealing with, with these broad-scale um, pictures dominated by geophysics, um, is very much the landscape scale and also dominated by paleogeographies. So when it comes to actually engaging with the archaeology in these areas, we're not really doing very well. Um, I have three sites on board here, on board, on the screen here, um, one of which is Mesolithic, um, and one obviously is a fine spot, so the middle one is Zealand Ridges, and we have Area 240 on the left. I should have also put Fermanville, which is in the channel um, off the north coast of France, um, but we have very, very few sites. And the key thing to note about these sites is that they're all found by chance. So if we want to move in a direction where we can start to actually understand the archaeology and the deposits in the offshore zone, um, we really need to try to move away from a reliance on chance finds um, and start to focus our efforts more clearly. And this is something that's been outlined as, um, as an objective um, by Historic England and by many people over recent years, is this idea of targeting our work in the offshore zone. So these are a few of the projects I'm going at the moment. So the one on the left is a project by uh, myself and colleagues at Southampton off the coast of Clacton. And on the right here, you have the elusive um, Haysborough 5 site, which is becoming less elusive um, as time moves on. Uh, the key thing about these is that we're using things like dry faunal remains, um, geophysical imagery, um, historic documents, oral histories, to try to bring them together to pinpoint areas on the seabed that we can then start to investigate, um, in this sense, by divers, so that we can actually start to understand the integrity um, of anything coming out of the deposits um, and the nature of the deposits themselves. But this work is incredibly challenging. So we know it's difficult to pinpoint these areas terrestrially, and um, it's even more difficult to pinpoint these areas offshore. Um, oh, I had a point to make there, but it's gone. Uh, oh, no, leave it, sorry. Um, okay, so what are some of the issues that we are encountering when we're working in terms of research? I would say, um, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, it's a very positive experience, so we seem to be moving in the same direction as some of the guidelines from Historic England, um, and they're really pushing for this work in the offshore zone. Um, but one of the challenges that we have come up against is kind of um, an issue of methods. So probably everything we have in terms of finds and artefacts that comes from the offshore zone comes out of... Um, inherently destructive means, so aggregate extraction or trawling, for example. But when we're working within research projects, it's debatable how far these destructive methods should really be being used or being suggested. So I'm talking in particular about things like targeted trawling or the use of grab samples in areas where we already know Pleistocene deposits exist, uh, because ultimately these are destructive and anything they bring up, they're bringing up out of context. Um, so it kind of seems like the use of these methods um, in, in research projects is almost like going back to this kind of smash and grab approach to archaeology, where yes, we have finds, but we have no idea about their context. Um, in the aforementioned projects, we're lucky enough to be able to dive. This isn't always the case, it's not always appropriate. So for example, sites like Area 240, you wouldn't have been able to dive that site, it wouldn't have been appropriate. So we do need to be thinking of other methodologies um, which maintain a level of that kind of stratigraphic integrity or the integrity of the artefacts that we find. Um, but they don't necessarily need to be things like grab samples, so could we work towards things, for example, like this is, this is an image of a box corer, so um, whilst you do get the kind of mobile sediments at the top, it also goes down further, so you're looking at the kind of top 40 centimetres, depending on the deposit, um, of outcropping deposits, but it maintains vertical integrity. So when we as archaeologists 
and curators, so Historic England, are thinking about methods we should be using and are suggesting methods to be used, they need to be considered and they need to be appropriate to the work that we're trying to do. Um, and this translates through to my first point of commercial challenges. I have three points here. Um, so the first one is that of consistency. Uh, so, as with terrestrially, um, the, work that I've got, the work that goes on offshore um, is a constant dialogue between the archaeologists, Historic England, um, the, the clients or the developers, and also the contractors. Um, for things to work well, obviously, this needs to be um, consistent. It needs to be clear. Everyone needs to know what they're doing and why they're doing it. But it doesn't always seem that this has been the case. So there have been examples um, where archaeological companies have proposed mitigation to clients offshore, um, but the clients have then been told by Historic England, you know, actually, you don't need to do that. Uh, but then in the future, when the same archaeologists in a similar situation have um, been working with the same clients, and they've kind of rolled back mitigation based on previous experience, they've then been told by Historic England that you need to be pushing this. And this kind of inconsistency is really only undermining um, the archaeologists and confusing the clients who are unsure about what exactly it is they should be doing with archaeology and what is the value of it. Um, the positive about this, of course, is that it's going from a situation where the value of the resource wasn't recognised or was being pulled back on to a situation where it's certainly being pushed. Um, and that's brilliant, of course. Um, and I think that's probably also coming out of the rapid development of offshore archaeology. So things are changing. Our, our understanding of the value of it is changing um, and the techniques we're using are changing. But perhaps it means that we do need to be sitting down and thinking about potentially updating guidelines a little bit more often so that we can present a united front about the value of the record. Um, and I'm going to return to this at the end. So my second point is one, again, of um, direct sampling. So the reason why we have so little direct sampling is usually to do with the fact that um, where engineers want to put their cores offshore is not necessarily the best place for archaeology. Um, this, of course, then leads to very little analysis going on, which again leads to a very poor understanding of the actual deposits that we have offshore. Um, there have been instances where archaeological companies have come in early and they've been able to get the clients to move the cores to areas that agree both with the engineer and with the archaeology, and that's fantastic. But it's done, we can't rely on it, and it doesn't seem to happen very often. So it kind of seems like one of those situations where we can't really get around it and we're just probably not going to have a very good record. But we could take the alternative approach of saying, why don't we stop being so apologetic about the work that we're trying to do as archaeologists? Stop being so apologetic about the money that it's going to cost and start trying, at least, to push the value of the work that we're doing um, and trying to, through conversations and presenting this United Front, try to get developers to actually pay for cause to be taken for archaeological purposes so that we can do analysis and understand the record more. Because if we don't start doing this, really, we're never really going to get anywhere. We're never going to understand the deposits that we actually have and the offshore record. And as was pointed out earlier by several people, I think it was Billy and also Francis, um, you know, we can have this mapping and then you put one core in and it completely changes the, what you understand about the record. Um, we need to start more direct sampling in the offshore zone. And my third point is one of watching wolves. So with the discovery of Area 240, um, his Wessex archaeology were given funding to start watching the wolves in the surrounding area for archaeology that was coming up. So that's obviously brilliant and definitely a step in the right direction. But it then raises questions about how far this has been taken elsewhere. And it kind of seems like um, archaeologists aren't really being given the support to watch wolves in other areas. Now this, of course, is this problem again that we have where if you're not finding stuff already coming out of uh, a wharf, coming out of wherever, then you're not going to get the funding to watch it. But of course that's a vicious circle because we know if we're not looking for it, we're also not going to find it, or we're very unlikely to find it. Um, but as has already been outlined today by several people, uh, the, we are well aware terrestrially of the value of... Is that time? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, we're well aware of the value um, of, the t of the resource in... Uh, Pleistocene terraces onshore, um, and we're well aware of the, that value in terms of secondary and primary contexts. Um, so why, just because these terraces have now been submerged, should we be treating them any differently? They have exactly the same value to us, and if we want to get back to actually looking at the human scale and actually um, involving ourselves and engaging with the archaeology in the offshore zone, then this seems like a good place to start. And again, potentially coming back to this idea that if um, 
whichever developer is extracting from these deposits, if they're destroying the deposits, then they should also be the ones funding the work to watch them, similar to a kind of watching brief offshore. And if we think about it compared to the terrestrial zone, um, where we have developer funding to put cores in, to put test bits in, and I know that it's not a perfect situation onshore, um, and often that results in not finding very much, why are we not doing the same thing? Why are we not applying the same principles offshore? Um, and I think this is a, a kind of direction that we should be looking to move in. Okay, so my final point is one of dissemination. Um, so again, this relates mostly to the commercial sector. Um, and it's essentially just about um, moving away from a reliance on chunky grey literature reports and towards peer-reviewed journal articles, preferably open access, things like monographs, who are, that are available to researchers, but also available to the general public. Um, the thing is, is when you talk to, and it, it does happen occasionally, as you can see, um, by this, of course, Area 240, published in JQS, and they've got a monograph out. Um, yeah, so when you talk to archaeologists about this, the archaeologists involved, everybody is really pro-publishing. Everybody thinks that they should be publishing the results of any research they do. Um, but their issues, of course, are one of our time and money. Um, Historic England also, um, in terms of their guidelines, are very much pushing for publication and definitely open access. Um, so why aren't we seeing more publications? Um, aside from the fact that very little analysis goes on. Uh, the two main problems seem to be data sensitivity. So, of course, if you're working offshore, some of the information you're working with is going to be sensitive. Um, so it may take longer to become unsensitive. Um, but also, a main issue seems to be client interest. So there seems to be the problem where clients offshore, they're not, they're not really used to the idea of publishing research, so they're not really interested in funding for you, for your time, to then go away and write these publications and to then publish them. Um, so there, I think there are two things to this. The first is, um, as a developer, if you're exploiting the seabed, if you're going to be paying for calls for analysis, then you also need to be paying for the dissemination or for the publication of this work. That kind of seems logical. Yeah, I know it's, it's a simplistic thing to say. Um, but, but in a less demanding way, it does seem like public engagement is a really good way to go. And if we're publishing things, then they are in the public sphere. Um, and public interest in archaeology, particularly offshore, is something that developers seem to be interested in. So if you go on their websites, you know, you find, look at the archaeology we found. So if we can kind of try to engage with developers in that sense, then potentially we can try to push for more funding to disseminate the results in open access journals. So how can we move forward? Um, so I presented several issues, but I would like to make the point um, that overall, through discussions with everyone I've talked to, um, it's very positive, so we're certainly moving in the right direction. Um, I think we're moving towards kind of pushing the value of the record. Um, and kind of the problems to do with consistency um, and clarity seem to possibly be coming out of that kind of positive situation and that we're moving very, very quickly and we're on quite a steep learning curve. So, for example, the model clauses, one minute, the model clauses that we were working with were written back in 2010. Um, and technology has moved massively since then, as has our understanding of the value of the record. So potentially what we need to do is update this, some of this guidance, um, as opposed to in the past where, we, or where this has been tendered out to individual companies, what we need to be doing is having a wider ranging discussion involving all of the archaeological companies, also involving Historic England, clients and contractors, so we can start to bring a kind of more uh, coherent idea of what's required in the offshore zone, why it's required and the value of this record and ultimately to push for increased developer funding for direct sampling, analysis and publication so that we can move this record up to the level of the offshore zone, onshore zone. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Rachel. Um, okay, we've now got oh, just about 25 minutes uh, for discussion. Um, just two quick reminders while I ask uh, Andy and Chantal to come up. Uh, the first is that the theme uh, for this discussion is what should our new priorities be? Um, and secondly, just a reminder for uh, questions and comments from the floor, if you can state your name before uh, your questions or comments. And with that, uh, over to you. Francis, I'll just hang on for the, for the mic. Hello, Francis, Smith. Um, 
And it's absolutely one to endorse what Rachel was just most recently saying about the, on, the, the offshore record is essentially the same as the onshore record, except it's underwater. We have to come to, to the antiquaries on that side. But, but in a curatorial sense, you, um, it needs to be treated similarly. So I suppose in terms of making things what happen should happen, it's a question of who are the curatorial authorities and persuading them. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, right, which one's that? Oh, sorry. After Francis agreed with what I said, I would also like to agree with what Francis says. <laughs> and yes, it is. I think it's, it's a case for all of the archaeologists involved pushing for it, but also the support of the curators, so support of Historic England. Um, and another thing that seemed to come out um, when I was talking to people was, you know, when you see the most change, when you see the most things happening, that is when Historic England are pushing for them. So if we can all get together and push for the archaeology, I think that hopefully we can start to move forward in this area. So... Actually, there's another question uh, for Rachel. Um, Rachel, given the um, quite complex and very different taphonomic issues you're facing, mm -hmm. um, do you think that the scale of question that you're asking needs to be adjusted? I mean, I can, I can see enormous... I mean, I know that that quote says we need to get to the archaeology <laughs> yeah. and the geography, but... Um, I, mean, I, don't, I think that was Matt Pope, anyway. <laughs> like that. Um, <laughs> Um, it, it just strikes me that, that you've you probably got some real in, inroads into mm -hmm. the distribution of Neanderthals in Doggerland and things like that. Do you think there's the potential for a box growth, an underwater box growth? Actually, so I think, I think the problem is, is that we tend to look at the offshore zone as this massive homogenous kind of mass, um, and we think about the, the erosion of it as something that's applied kind of as a blanket and I don't know I mean the problem is of course is that because we have so little direct sampling and most of it's based on geophysics you know we at the moment can't necessarily answer those questions but I don't see why not um, I think excavation of it would be very difficult obviously we have kind of um, you know Tibran I don't know how you say it actually uh, in, um, in Danish waters which is, is perfectly preserved and beautifully excavated but in the North Sea or somewhere obviously we have very different conditions but in terms of the potential for that actually to preserve. Yeah, and no, I kind of do think that we could, because it would depend on the initial burial conditions. So if it was buried quickly um, and has been covered since and is now eroding, uh, then yes, I think I think there is potential for those deposits to have survived. But of course, I don't know if we can really answer those questions properly without a better understanding of the nature of the deposits we have, because at the moment it is mostly geophysically defined and, and we just have these occasional areas where we have through it, um, but then he, yeah, yeah, I don't know, basically. Becky. Hello, Becky Scott. I've possibly got quite a stupid question, um, which is, so what actually happens when someone's doing offshore work? Who's responsible for putting conditions of any sort? Are on, you talking commercially? Yeah, if, if there's a development, a pipeline, or, yeah. or, or a cable, or whatever, going in yeah. offshore, who's responsible for saying what conditions there should be? And where does that stop yeah. and become a terrestrial responsibility? I mean, possibly a, a question to... I was going to say, so, I mean, I could give you an answer, but I think a better answer would come from either Louise or Kristen, who both work in those sectors commercially, um, and my knowledge of that is, is, is more fuzzy. So would one of those two be able to answer that? Question better, Louise or Kristen? Oh. Sorry, Kristen, uh, no, I'm very sorry. So, what was the question? Who's responsible for it? Yes. Yes. Um, and where does that stop? Where does it become a terrestrial responsibility of the the onshore? Or the onshore. Um, onshore. So we work with high low, high watermark, low watermark, depending on on how the onshore archaeologists are kind of willing to work with us, but that's kind of where we stop. So we have to liaise with them if there's any work done in this tidal zone, for example, because often the cables come on shore as well. We go to the centers and it's on shore. Sorry, Becky, how have you got here? The um, responsibility for the local planning authorities runs down to me, low water. So there's always an overlap between the what counts as marine development if there was a high water. Um, and the archaeological advisors to the marine environment are historic England 
Yeah, just a question on that. How does that work? Sorry. How does that actually work? Does it function? Is that a functioning relationship? I mean, is it... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just interested, that's all. It's just, that's why... I'm Chris Bay, I'm from Historic England, I deal with uh, really local matters right around England. Um, and the reason I was asking you about it is taking your lives in your hands <laughs> you're inviting me to ask questions <laughs> Clive Clive Campbell uh, I, I'm coming back to a, a, a point that um, John Lewis made before lunch about how the, uh, uh, how the general public in the Paleolithic starts with Neolithic archaeologists uh, but uh, we, we, we move very quickly um, because we still are perceived as um, uh, having fairly uh, recondite knowledge. Uh, I'm not, I've been thinking about this over lunch, and I'm not really so sure. I think I can be equally baffled by someone going on about the wonders of Samian or, or brooch types or whatever. Uh, I think I can get very lost too. Um, but, but the point of the question is that what we've heard from all three speakers this afternoon uh, and many this morning is this whole citizen science, Andy in particular was talking about it, and how there is a large engagement of, of people out there uh, who have made these discoveries, and uh, uh, Danielle knows this very well through the um, uh, National Ice Age Network, and uh, it, it, I keep coming back to these phrases that we're getting, that one is expect the unexpected, and Francis and I dealt with a site which just shouldn't have been there, this was Red Barns, uh, and it shouldn't appear on any maps because there were no Pleistocene deposits on the BGS maps, and yet here was this wonderful Pleistocene uh, site. Uh, and the only way we found out about that was an interested uh, uh, amateur archaeologist, Chris Draper. So I just wonder if uh, the three speakers could talk a little bit more about the engagement of citizen science in helping us with the theme of this session, which is sort of understanding more uh, about uh, what we want to know. Who'd like to go first? <laughs> well, I think with the, with the Jersey experience, the, the thing is, which, which is interesting, is because we've created through our work the interest in this material, people with on Jersey have got interest in it, are very keen to find material on these beach fronts. So you've had people walking up and down looking for material now for the, for the first time, but the question then becomes, what happens next? So in, ter in, ter in terms of people want to be and are engaged with the work that we do, and we need to, and we, and we, and collectively, in terms of heritage management, and also as, uh, as specialists, should should use should use that and be part of, part of that. But the question is, for putting in systems in place to manage it, and um, at least on Jersey currently, those systems don't exist. So it's a question of creating the link between the discovery and its and it, and giving it value through the systems that link it to heritage management. I'd say. That's fine. Yeah, something I meant to mention and didn't really, the importance of sort of um, amateur field workers in finding many of the sites that I, I mentioned, Rookery Farm for, for, for a start, and also um, uh, uh, Roy, Roy Froome's work on Longblade and Mesolithic sites in the Ken Kennet. I think, for, I mean, there's always going to be people like Roy who 
really ga engage with, uh, with, with uh, the archaeological community. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the key things from experience is sort of um, vis a visibility in the landscape. So at Starcar, when we've been doing open days at Jersey, when we've had quite, a, we're doing lots of open days and engagement, then you have lots of people who are who really interested in archaeology and be very keen to engage and be finding lots of sites. That's when you get much more of a of a dialogue. So I think sort of higher presence and higher sort of a, a visibility on the ground really encourages people to 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 engage with you, and you can then sort of uh, feed back and. Obviously, not so many formal uh, mechanisms in place, but at least sort of this sharing of, of knowledge and awareness is really important. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a good point, the kind of being visible. So um, I think one of the key things in terms of the offshore stuff, but also the coastal stuff, is what Nick was talking about earlier, which is the, um, the work they're doing, working with the volunteers who are going up and down the East Anglian coastline. Um, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of them... <coughs> Kind of met through excavations at Haysbury Three. Is that correct? You kind of, you know, you, you're visible there, um, and people come forward and show you stuff and have an interest. Um, and from my experience as well, this whole kind of Neolithic almost thing. I'm not so sure it's true. Whenever I talk to anyone about the kind of offshore stuff and the paleolithic things, as long as you throw in some woolly mammoths, everyone seems to be really, really interested in that. So I think. Kind of forgotten the question, but I think that in terms of um, getting the public engaged with this stuff, there is a lot of scope with the Paleolithic. Um, but I do think it, uh, being present um, and and actually having a dialogue with, with the people who are interested is really important, and also almost having a dialogue with them that isn't that isn't massively formal, because sometimes when you set up these huge schemes, they I don't know they seem to be less like less human, less personable. They don't necessarily seem to work so well. But when you have to kind of argue through not doing so much, I suppose, having on a small scale, but, but when you can build relationships with the people and um, actually have discussions with them, um, then people seem to be very, very willing to get involved and very interested in the Paleolithic resource. So I think there's a lot of scope for it. And just, uh, I mean, Nikki Milner's real drive to sort of increase public engagement with, uh, with the Mesolithic, it turns out there is a lot of public interest in the Mesolithic even. <laughs> so as Paleolithic archaeologists with massive climate change, mammoths, Neanderthals wandering about the landscape, I mean, these are things that can make more of. Nick at that. Hello, Nick, Nick Barton. I just have one thing you've forgotten about, too, to mention, I'm sure, is the heritage of archaeology in the family. And the fact that there are many big projects that are going on at the moment which are funded in this way and which bring out volunteers and train volunteers to become archaeologists and indeed to engage in field work. I'm involved in one of these projects with Daryl Darton, who's here in the room. And I'm wondering whether Daryl would say one or two words. Sorry to put you on the spot, Daryl. I think you're in charge of it. Volunteer schemes are great. There are a lot of people out there with a, with a lot of interest, even in your flint flake. Um, but they do need people to lead them. And it's not like leading a commercial team. Uh, you have to manage this interest um, incredibly carefully. It's very time consuming. But if they can, if the money can be found for the people to lead them, you'll, you'll get more work. But the volunteers are a very delicate resource. Um, catch them just as they retire, and you'll get a wonderful workforce. But don't expect them to organise things. Expect them to come along, enjoy themselves, and do what they want to do. The hard work of organisation and planning has to be paid for by somebody else. There's another, at least two more questions to come from the floor. But do any of you three want to make a quick response to the last? From my experience, I, can, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, I, I think that's the, the thing is if we can, people collecting data when we're around is fine, but I can totally agree it's the management of that process and the data which comes out of it, which is the tricky bit and requires money. Uh, which is archaeology, um, just on the um, endangerment of short, 
one um, some of the protocols that are now running offshore uh, aren't targeted necessarily at the moment um, the general public, but are targeting uh, people who work within the industry and uh, through the aggregate industry, the offshore wind, and now trialling uh, also with fishermen. And with the advent of the marine antiquities scheme that's currently being developed uh, with the Crown Estate, this is involving a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily come into contact with archaeology, who are very interested in finding flint flakes and fallen remains, and they are adding the two on the edge offshore. And yes, they are in fine spots, and as we say, yes, you know, we do want to be looking more um, direct sampling, but it is actually adding um, greatly. To our understanding of offshore and where you're likely to find this material. Can I respond to that? I, I, no, I'd just like to say that um, that I complete I completely agree, and that the direct sampling aspect of things. Um, that the fine spots are really important, the chance finds are really important, and all those schemes are brilliant because they can help us to then kind of refine our efforts to where we're looking. Um, to, and, and I, I suppose they're two, two different things. The direct sampling is incredibly important, but it does, I don't think it's an either or. Um, and these projects which are being trialled and being rolled out are, yeah, definitely fantastically important and engaging with people that we wouldn't otherwise. I agree. Uh, huh. Just a, a point on the citizen science, and I think you raised the point about the to return to Jersey and uh, draw to people's attention the fact that there is an opportunity to revise the environment law and the draft um, is going to be prepared for December and Jersey Heritage and the states of Jersey are well aware of the difficulties and problems regarding uh, the foreshore and they are actively engaged in trying to do something about that at the moment. Uh, yeah I mean obviously yes because I, I entirely agree with that. I think this is a big opportunity for, for Jersey in that, in that regard with everything that's happening on Jersey now to put systems in place which can act as a model for other places to use and I, yeah, I entirely endorse that. Francis Griffith. I completely endorse what Hannah has said about the need for the HERs to receive this information and we've touched a bit about the problems of the decimation of curatorial archaeology in the local authorities today. One area that is anything is getting slaughtered even faster from planning archaeologists is museum archaeologists. Mm. There are many museums where we should have had a curator of archaeology for 50 or 100 years who now have one curator and it's probably the fine arts person. And this is still the natural place for any person finding a hand axe in the field to wander off and report. And that is probably an even weaker link in the chain than the HERs at the moment, and we should be putting a lot of our energies into trying to support these places. I guess this kind of picks up on, on your point, and you know, if we are going to be more effective in becoming, you know, uh, having a fully public dimension to our work, and we've got lots of concerns about the archaeological record, we've got concerns about cu curation of artefacts. The only way we're going to do this is if we make sure we have proper connections within the discipline, um, you know, right the way through to, to museums, identifying areas where there, there aren't, is no coverage, there, there aren't any connections at all, and, and that's got to be more effective networks. Um, just to sort of follow on to that, you know, field walking, you know, if we go to the terrestrial zone and the plow zone, examples you gave were field walked sites. Surface scatters, you know, they tend to be denigrated as a very poor record. Um, we can't designate them and protect them in that way. But, um, you know, is, do you think there's scope for reviewing surface scatters and how we, how we treat them, how we process them? I guess that's why I'm pushing on 
Yes, definitely. And I think once once we have an understanding, a really detailed understanding of what our record is in particular locations, um, we can we can do we can do a lot with it. And I think Lawrence's uh, uh, Lawrence Benjamin's work is really um, showing that. I mean, some some surface uh, uh, finds we know very little about, and we can't do very much much with it. But others are really. Uh, decent resolution sites where we can make important points about about human action but it's again it's sort of without knowing the, without sort of assessing the record and that and without knowing sort of landscape histories and histories creation the curation those are uh, and, and uh, methodologies of field walking these are, are quite difficult to do so it's about sort of putting uh, money and effort into knowing this uh, slightly unknowable <laughs> record I think but yeah they are really important and they're the majority of our of material, we can't uh, we can't dismiss them. Just, just one thing, it just because like what Matt was saying is isn't really one of the things that underlines a lot of all of all of these things is networks and connections between people and groups are the things that need to be looked at because there's a lot of expertise and a lot of these elements of these things that people are doing, but the connectivity between people is perhaps and where that connectivity isn't there needs to be reviewed, and that would make things a whole lot more effective. It seems to be the underlying thing I was thinking. Any don't have time. Any perhaps one final time for one final question? Sounds tricky. <laughs> <laughs> who'd, like to, who'd like to take that? I think that sounds like a post tea. <laughs> yeah, um, I think, I mean, some of the groups in CAT have been really good at, um, uh, at, at these networks, but they're sort of self created at the, at the moment. Um, and I think people are really keen to engage and, and give advice. So I think it's maybe a way of sort of may, uh, letting people know who. Who they should be going to, um, so may uh, yeah may uh, getting names of people who are interested, and but in 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 a in a slightly more formal way where people can go uh, and get get more ex expert advice. Who people very often finding very specific archaeology that they need to go beyond their their region to to get expertise on. So something more formal would be would be really useful because it's just so piecemeal at the at the moment. Uh, so can I just say that there are there are flows there are. Finds the liaison officers. Yeah. And, uh, yes, yeah. I don't know if there is one in Kent, but there certainly is one yeah. covering the Oxfordshire area. And they meet once a month mm -hmm. in the Ashmolean Museum with archaeologists who are on a hand there, and these are publicised, and people bring in their finds. So maybe, I don't know whether it's true, you know, Kent has got a particular problem. I'm on the show, so I am Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. So it can work well in some areas. Yeah, and I, th I, th I think sort of lithic, uh, sort of increasing lithic expertise amongst the, the finds officers as part of, um, which, which is starting to happen, I think, sort of Nick, uh, Nick Ashton's project has got training, put, yes, put, 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 put in for that, and I was sort of hoping to get some mesolithic training, but didn't get the grant, but yeah, I think that, that's, re that's really sort of important, sort of um, creating that sort of knowledge, that sort of link between, um, sort of, for directing people, um, for just for basic identification, but if there's something that that needs that sort of needs more, would benefit for sort of extra expertise, sort of directing them where where to go, would be really important. Is really important. Yeah. 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 Could you speak up? I think. Yeah. Just perhaps just a quick comment, Liz. I think we want to give people a people a breather, if okay. possible. I mean, we can, come, we can come back to this, I think, in the end discussion. But I think if we take uh, 
a break there for 15 minutes. If you can be back for 3.30 and just join me in thanking the three speakers.